Now joining us to talk about your health is Dr. Bert O'Malley, the president and chief executive officer of the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. You're celebrating a bicentennial there. Tell us a little bit about the, the history of your institution. Well, thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. So we are 200 years. Happy birthday to us. Um, and the, um, I think the significance, one, is the uniqueness of Maryland, the medical center, and what its mission is, and that it's been doing it for so long. So I'll, I'll kind of summarize on that. The uh, University of Maryland Medical Center is an academic medical center. And what does that mean? In medicine, the academic medical centers are those that provide excellent and highly complex care. They're referral centers for other hospitals around a state or a region. Um, they provide training for residents and medical students, really training the future of medicine um, across an entire state or, or many students, they go across a nation. And they have a research or discovery mission. So they're doing science and experiments to try to build and develop and discover the cures of the future, new treatments, new drugs, new surgical procedures and therapies. And that is academic medicine. Now, Maryland, University of Maryland Medical Center is unique among ac academic medical centers, in my opinion, because of that, what we call a tripartite mission, the University of Maryland Medical Center has a quadripartite mission. It was established 200 years ago by faculty physicians of the School of Medicine for training and education. It was the first, so the reports say, the first teaching hospital in the United States of America, and it was built in the community, the city, and in the West Baltimore community. And in that teaching, a part of it was providing access to an underserved community and reaching out and connecting with the community. So the medical center's community mission is incredibly strong. It has grown over 200 years for this quadripartite mission. So that's what we're celebrating, our uniqueness and what we do. What are some of the, the milestones or accomplishments uh, over the centuries that, that stand out for you? Um, so there are quite a few, but I'll, I'll name a couple uh, that are that we feel are, are, are very significant. One, in 1968, we established the first trauma hospital and trauma program in the United States of America, Shock Trauma. And Shock Trauma remains the, a unique trauma center, not only in the state, in the nation, if not unique in the world, that it's fully dedicated. Emergency rooms and receiving units, operating rooms, recovery rooms, ICUs and floors, and all the wraparound services needed to care for patients of trauma, all within and dedicated to trauma. There's nothing like that. That was 68. 77, um, the medical center opened the first neonatal intensive care unit called the NICU. Um, and those are for premature babies. Years ago, even just a decade ago, the babies that are being born today did not survive. We were able to keep these 19, 20, 21 week plus babies alive in a very intense care called the neonatal intensive care unit. It was the first and it remains the largest NICU in the state of Maryland. Um, we did uh, the first, we developed new treatments for breast cancer, Dr. Angela Brody. They called they were called aromatase inhibitors and they helped prevent recurrence of breast cancer. That was in the early 2000s. Performed the first combined heart liver transplant in the state in 2007, in early, two, uh, maybe, a few years later, around 2012, the first comprehensive broad face transplant in the world. And then and something that's hit the news recently, last year in 2022, and then recently as of five weeks ago, the first animal, a pig heart, transplant into a live human. So, you know, we're steep in discovery and innovation. I only outlined a few. Over the, the couple hundred years, there have been a variety of public health emergencies. You would have been in business for the Spanish flu and the, the pandemic that we just had. When you think about your focus on community, those are really challenging times, but, but also an, an opportunity to, to make a huge difference in the community. So COVID was craziness, right? And unprecedented. I wasn't around for the Spanish flu, but I read a lot about it and learned a lot more during COVID. But I was right in the midst of it at COVID as the CEO of the medical center. And it was really, really challenging. One thing we did demonstrate was our commitment to the community. We And we set up testing centers, vaccina vaccination centers, including working with the system for the opening up an entire stadium. We had mobile vaccination trucks and um 
and buildings that, that we built so that we can provide the testing and vaccination for our community with a strong focus for the medical center on West Baltimore. In, in addition to running the medical center, you also find time to uh, perform surgery. Tell, tell us a little bit about your, your professional background and, and your specialty in head and neck surgery. Sure. So officially, the residency is in otorhinolaryngology head and neck surgery, others uh, commonly known as ENT. Within that subspecialty is a further subspecialty of head and neck and skull-based tumor surgery. And that is my subspecialty. Um, I was also a scientist in the early days. I do less science now, uh, given the CEO role, but I'm able to keep up my surgical uh, focus on head and neck cancer, and in particular, robotic surgery. How, how much have the robots changed that uh, specific type of operation? Well, robot surgery is, in, in many ways, and components is transforming uh, healthcare on the surgical side across specialties. So I'm a little biased, I have to admit, because in 2004, um, myself and a, a colleague, Dr. Greg Weinstein, uh, uh, conceived, invented, and developed transoral robotic surgery. Um, so uh, that then became FDA approved in 2009 with subsequent approvals for the use. So what that did for us, I'll say from my expertise in head and neck cancer, and I won't go into too much detail, and, um, but classically for tumors in the back of the throat, to get there, Jeff, for anybody surgically, you'd have to open up the face and jaw and do some very destructive things to the human body, um, requiring tubes in your neck to breathe and so forth, because to get to the tumor, you have to open up the body. So that was long operations, high complications, high risk, and all kinds of other things that go, go along with it. So the benefit of the robot using the instruments, it can climb into the mouth with tiny little hands, much smaller than our human hands, and do surgery from inside out. So you take a 10-hour surgery and it becomes an hour and a half without those um, destructive side effects. So that really is, in, in my world, how it transformed surgical approaches to cancer. And, and when I talk about robotic surgery, it may sound like the robot's doing all the work. I mean, the the surgeon still doing the procedure, but with, um, you know, the miniaturization, the, the stabilization that the equipment offers. Tell us, where is that field heading? I, I read a fascinating thing recently about how the, the robots with their high definition cameras will ultimately be able to see things that you can't really, you could not see with, with your eyes. They'll be able to tell you if there's some stray uh, surprise blood vessel right behind where you're about to go, that sort of thing. So a lot into that question here. So I, I will clarify, as at this present time, when we do robot surgery, you have a patient with the robot instrumentation in whatever part of the body we're operating on. For me, it would be through the mouth from the back of the throat um, in an operating room. At the same time, the surgeon um, is sitting 10 feet away on a console, sitting on a console, looking through goggles on a machine in 3D, almost like a video game, moving moving controls that translate to moving the instruments on the robot. So the surgeons are doing the procedure. So a couple of things, what's into the future? Well, we'll start with the, what you mentioned, the visualization or optics. Think of a microscope, right? We can look at a, a, a slide or a, a little bit of tissue. A microscope can look at the cell level, something our eyes can't see. So the power of magnification and optics, telescopes looking into the universe is what we could bring in. So yes, we could see blood vessels or nerves that are only a millimeter away that we want to spare and save. We all might be able to see tumor cells that we can't see with our human eye to say, oh, we need to remove a little bit more to make sure we get that tumor out. So the that benefit is we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. And then the second thing is, I don't know if at one point, but the technology is working on it. Can a surgeon being there and governing it outline a procedure just like a machine does, uh, uh, puts together a car or the, or like these 3D printers? Can it actually do a component that's automated? And, and who knows where that's going to go? So when you, when you think about entering your third century as, as an institution, 
I, I guess even the size you have and the history you have, do you have to focus on, on some key areas? We want to be the leaders, the innovators in, in these couple of fields. And what do you want that to be? What, what do you want the University of Maryland Medical Center to be known for across its uh, third century? So well, that's a great point. Um, we, we're, I want to uh, state for sure that we are and value all aspects of medicine. We provide comprehensive medicine at every level of education, clinical care, research. Um, so, but in differentiating yourself, I'm trying to be the world leader. You, 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 it's not possible to be a world leader in everything at the same time. Uh, although some of those come and go with our, our physicians making a discovery in some area. So when I explain a, uh, the focus, it's not to that we're de-emphasizing anything else. It's where we have current momentum in discovery or in presence and delivery of care across our state. So one is cardiovascular surgery. Um, and, and we have a tremendous uh, surgical team. We have a ter tremendous research team. And the, the uh, uh, porcine uh, heart transplant first in the world is a classic example. We're world leaders in that. And there's a lot of science and immunology and, and laboratory work that needs to go on to continue to advance that. So that's a big focus of ours is cardiovascular. Neuroscience is another one, both neurosurgery and neurology. And we have programs such as high intensity focus ultrasound um, that are, that are few, only a few places in the world that are doing this and across the nation where we take radio waves and concentrate them into a tiny little point to try to hit a part of the brain that stops people from having tremors and motion disorders. Uh, it's, it's transformative. So that is a strong effort. Given the fact that we mentioned the heart transplant, the first in the state combined heart um, and, ki and kidney transplant that I mentioned earlier, transplantation in general is a big focus of ours uh, and emphasis as we move into the future. Doctor, you, you sound like a guy who can't wait to get back to work. So we really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about the, uh, the history and the future of University of Maryland Medicine. Dr. Bert O'Malley, thank you for your time. Thank you. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.